All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining the session on DNS detection and response. Um, I am Krupa Srivatsan, Senior Director of Product Marketing at Infoblox, and I focus on Infoblox's cybersecurity solutions. Um, so we, I'll talk a little bit about um, how the way that Infoblox does security is unique. Uh, but more importantly, I want to talk about this or I want to educate our audience on what uh, DNS detection and response can offer um, for a security uh, a team and, and how it can help uh, speed up incident response, you know, discover hidden threats and things like that. So let me just put this on slideshow mode. So let's get into it. Um, I don't need to enumerate all the challenges that organizations face in today's complex world. Um, there's a lot of things that are happening from um, a network perspective that adds to the complexity. A lot of organizations are moving their workloads to the cloud or adopting multi-cloud environments um, or hybrid cloud environments. Like they've got some uh, applications and workloads still on premises, some in the cloud. Uh, Main reason being, you know, um, to for availability reasons, um, things like that, and, and all the benefits that a cloud environment provides. On top of that, SaaS has been, uh, 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 you know, a big trend in the sense that more and more applications are now being delivered as a SaaS service, and so we are no longer behind VPN firewalls and things like that. Um, and we are moving to. Uh, a situation where there are a lot of non-standard devices on the network as well. And this is across the board in many verticals, including healthcare, manufacturing. Um, you know, we see a lot of OT technology being uh, being used, which are actually now connected to the network. Uh, they, are, they are processing data, they're gathering data from let's say a factory floor, for example, uh, and they're sending that data uh, uploading it to the cloud for processing and analysis and optimization of manufacturing processes. Same thing with IoT, connected devices, smart thermometers, whatever, smart uh, thermostats, whatever it is. All of these devices are now connected to the network. And what that means is the attack surface is also expanding, right? You could have a compromise um, from your IoT devices. Maybe they're forming a botnet and launching DDoS attacks or exfiltrating data. Uh, you could have compromise in your cloud environments. Uh, in addition to the standard, you know, traditional um, security challenges that we've seen on in on-premises networks, now we have to deal with all of these other environments as well. And of course, we have the uh, remote user, work from home user, or work from anywhere user, right? They need, their devices need to be protected as well. So long story short, I think the way we look at the network has changed. And what it means is all of these changes are causing a strain on our security operations teams, right? So more and more what we're seeing is it's really hard to find skilled SecOps professionals, um, you know, even after so many years of um, knowing some of these challenges, uh, it's still hard to find dedicated, uh, really high skilled security operations teams. So the existing security teams are having to do more with less, um, you know, I, and most, most organizations use, you know, 20, 30 different security tools, depending on the size of their network, but their staff are not able to manage all of them in, a, in an effective way, I would say. Um, and so it's no surprise that uh, when IBM was doing the data breach report last year, they found that it takes more than 270 days to identify and contain a breach. That is like three fourths of a year, which means that malware is dwelling in companies' networks for that long of a period of time before it's being contained um, and rectified. So. That's not an ideal situation by any means, right? Uh, the more malware dwells in the networks, the um, you know the more opportunity it has to do things like spread laterally or exfiltrate data, drop in ransomware, things like that. So it's going to affect the business at some point in terms of 
you know, outages or, uh, you know, fines, brand damage, lost customers. When, you know, when you see the data, ex data breaches happening, um, you know, generally that company does take a little bit of a hit in terms of brand reputation. Um, and we all know the cost of a data breach is, is immense. So, um, so these are some of the challenges just to lay the groundwork. But what, what one of the things that most people don't realize is there is a protocol that is being used in 92% of cyber attacks. Now, this is a protocol that is um, leveraged significantly for command and control or CNC as we call it, right? Um, that is when, uh, when a network has been breached and a remote device is now under the control of the bad actor, he uses command and control to send additional instructions to that, uh, to that device or to drop in ransomware or exfiltrate data. So, um, so this predominantly happens over the protocol which is DNS, right? So DNS is one of these unique infrastructure elements in all networks that spans the entire organization, right? You need DNS to operate any connected um, device. So it could be on in, in campus networks, at, at home, um, your IoT devices, your cloud resources, your cloud environments, all of them use DNS because you need DNS to go to a website or access an application or uh, do your email. And it, DNS is one of those unique uh, elements that is, again, spans the entire organization. The other thing that uh, most people don't realize is it is also the first uh, hop when you do anything online. So it's the closest to the end devices and end hosts. So every time you wanna do email or go to a website, the first thing that happens is your request goes to the local DNS server and that DNS server then uh, resolves your request and connects you to the destination, the IP address of the, of the website, for example. So it's close to the end devices. And finally, it it has a rich source of telemetry. So what do I mean by that? At any given point of time, DNS knows uh, what a user or device has been doing, uh, what it is doing now, what has it been doing in the last week or 30 days. Uh, it has a rich source of uh, telemetry in the DNS logs itself that tells you what resources each device has been accessing, where it has been going um, on the internet, things like that. So. Traditionally, DNS has been thought of as a network protocol, but keeping that aside, if you look at it from a security perspective, now you have this control point that is everywhere on your network that sees that first request from any device anywhere, right? And it knows what those devices have been doing. So it makes a lot of sense to use DNS for security. Right. And that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about is how can you use DNS for security? And one of the things that um, that uh, we talk about a lot is DNS can shift left protection. So what do I mean by that? When you look at a typical cyber kill chain, right? First, what happens is um, an end device, and then uh, a device makes a request to a destination on the internet. So what happens, the DNS server gets that request, as I mentioned earlier, it does um, a lookup. When it's doing the lookup, um, uh, it will, um, you know, then that, tra that traffic, go the application traffic goes to the rest of your security devices, like your firewalls or your gateways. And then finally, that device is now connected to the uh, destination. Now, let's say that destination is hosting malware. So at this point now, the malware gets downloaded onto the device, right? And now that device has been compromised because that de the website was hosting some sort of malware. And now that's been downloaded onto the device. And now that bad actor has control of that um, device. In this whole kill chain, what you saw was DNS was that first point of connection. It made that, it processed that request to connect to the destination. 
So what if you used threat intelligence, known bad internet destinations, right? Block list, right? You block any known, any request to known malicious destinations. And you also leverage some advanced analytics on the DNS queries. So you know if there are patterns of, let's say data exfiltration, things like that. Then you can prevent this whole chain of events at the first connection, the earliest point of connection or the earliest point in the kill chain. DNS is as early it gets in the kill chain. So if you block that initial request, you are now doing what's called prevention, right? You are not even allowing that device to go to that suspicious destination. So you're, we call it shifting left of protection, right? So that is the value of, of DNS. Even before your firewalls or your gateways can see it, um, your DNS can, can block it. Again, it's protocol agnostic. We don't care what device it's coming from. It can protect any system anywhere. Um, including IoT and OT, so that's an added benefit. Um, and you know, now we keep hearing about uh, you know these regulations for blocking things like TikTok. So how do you know if your um, if your uh, users are are you know using TikTok? You can find out what applications are being used uh, with our app with the application discovery feature in in a in a, sec a DNS security solution. So now you know you have visibility into what applications are being used, and then you can set policy, whatever your, your policy is. You wanna block it, you wanna log it, and then monitor it, things like that, right? So that level of discovery you can do using DNS as well. The other thing I would say is, and we have some recent examples of this, is um, you can leverage what's called DNS-based threat hunting. So this is not just looking at malware stuff, but also monitoring uh, infrastructure, malicious or suspicious infrastructure that is being set up for launching future attacks, right? We can call it pre-crime, whatever you want to call it. Um, but a, a DNS secure, a, a threat intelligence that is focused on DNS will look for these um, infrastructures that are being set up by bad actors. And you can even start blocking those um, using feeds like suspicion, suspicious domains feeds. So even before they can leverage that infrastructure for attacks, you can start blocking any resolution to those domains. Um, these are, again, these are advanced DNS specific threat hunting that, have, that a vendor can do for you to make sure you're protected um, even before those attacks start. Uh, you can use that same method to protect against domain, domain generation algorithms or DGAs, lookalike domains and things like that. Um, and, and because you're blocking it at the DNS level, the earliest point, there is less work that your next-gen firewalls or your uh, web gateways need to do. So you're kind of offloading some of that work from those more expensive um, security devices. DNS is actually not only the easiest way to provide threat protection, but it's also a very cost-effective way to do threat protection because you're now, it's a phishing net that spans your entire network and you're catching a lot of the bad threats um, early um, and you're offloading some of these other security devices. So the, the topic of the day is data detection and response. And I talked a lot about detection so far, right? Um, but DNS detection and response is more than just threat detection. You want to think about, okay, you've detected and you blocked something, but what if that, um, but don't you want to know which devices in the network um, the, the suspicious requests activities came from, right? So, uh, you know, many security tools will generate an alert. They will give you a source IP address but that's about it. Now it's the onus is on the security operations teams to go hunt and figure out where was the uh, activity coming from? Because so, so IP addresses keep changing, they're dynamic. So without much other information, it becomes a manual tedious process for the security operations teams to correlate the information and figure out exactly which part of the network is affected. Um, there are two other technologies that are closely related to DNS, which is IP address management and DHCP. 
these two technologies will give you that visibility and context that a security operations team needs to uh, speed up that correlation and response. So you can get quick and easy device and user attribution. For example, left versus right on this screen, uh, you know, a traditional security event from a standard security tool may just give you the IP address. Whereas if you use DNS, DHCP and IPAM as a, a coordinated solution for security, you can get not only the source IP, but the MAC address, right? Um, the username, if it is an, a laptop or an end user device and not like a printer or a server, then you can get the username. Uh, what type of device it is, right? So Windows 7, for example. What part of the network it is in, right? It's a VLAN 144, the location is in a Las Vegas casino. Um, so now you know which part of the network the, uh, the activity came from. So now the security operations teams, it's easy for them to go and maybe get Adam's laptop and, and see if it's been breached or there's some malware, piece of malware running on it. Uh, check for any you know, patches that have not been um, you know, uh, updated, things like that. So there's a lot of response activities uh, that can be done when you have this level of visibility and context. Um, so this is the response side of DNS detection and response. The other aspect of the, so typically when digging a little bit deeper into this, typically, um, you know, when you do an incident response, these are the, you know, every organization's response process is different, but this is, let's say this is a typical incident response process, right? There's detection, you need to gather data for validation, right? Um, you want to do an immediate containment and then you do a long-term remediation and recovery. So you've got a few steps around that immediate containment, initial containment, some reporting, you gather more data for remediation and then you do the longer term remediation and recovery and then final reporting and post incident review. This is usually kind of a standard, um, you know, incident response steps that is recommended by analysts, right? So where does DNS, DHCP and IPAM fit into this uh, process is for detection, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, when there is a malicious, uh, when there is a request to go to a malicious destination, known malicious destination, DNS has that visibility and it can uh, detect that, right? Um, and it can even, even block that. Uh, DHCP will, will give you, like I said, the type of device that, um, that is making that request, right? Based on the uh, fingerprint information that DHCP has. The reason DHCP is able to do that is because every time an asset comes on the network, when uh, when an IP address is uh, is assigned to it, the DHCP server does it. So it it pings the device, then gets information about the type of device before it assigns the IP address. So that's why it has that level of information. Uh, when you're doing data gathering for validation, um, uh, you know there there are tools that are available with the with the Infoblox solution as well. But there are tools that are available um, that can help with threat investigation uh, with the context. So let's say uh, a particular uh, URL was blocked by the DNS or why was it blocked? So uh, that can that information can be leveraged in a threat investigation tool uh, where you can use the indicators of compromise and, and show more information about that. This URL has been um, known to be associated with XYZ ransomware threat, for example. That investigation with the context can be provided in, in, in a tool like that. So now you know why you blocked something. Um, and then for urgent response and remediation, you know, we could, uh, I, one thing I didn't talk about are integrate, is integrating the DNS security with the rest of your ecosystem solutions. So let's say you have a vulnerability scanner, you have ITSM, you have a SIM or a source solution. Uh, once the DNS detection happens and the blocking happens at the DNS layer, you can trigger a scan in real time for example, with the vulnerability scanner and say, okay, I got this uh, request from this endpoint. I think there could be something going on. We need to scan it for vulnerabilities. You can do that real-time scanning um, with the ecosystem integrations. 
Uh, the other ex another example would be uh, this device made a request that uh, that is blocked because you know it is going to a ransomware site, but uh, maybe we need to ra automatically raise a service now ticket to so the IT team can take a look at the device. So those type of integrations are available uh, that can be leveraged by the security teams. So you're actually speeding up some of the remediation actions uh, with this automation and and integrations. The other thing is. All that visibility and data that DHCP and IP address management provides, everything we saw in that box, the right side box in the previous slide, uh, that data can be easily shared with a SIM or a SOAR tool, again, for easy analysis. So all of these integrations help with, uh, not only with the immediate urgent response, but also longer term remediation. Um, the other thing that DNS has, I mentioned earlier in this presentation, is it has um, that of telemetry. So it knows historically what, um, what destinations each device or user has been going to the last week, last 30 days. There's a wealth of information with timestamps, right? That's available in the DNS logs that can be leveraged for data correlation um, as well. And then finally, reporting, um, there are, uh, you know, because we have information on the device, the activity, uh, and, and everything that it's been doing, uh, you know, you can easily identify were there other devices that was going to that malicious destination that was blocked, right? Sometimes it's not just one endpoint that is uh, affected or compromised. There could be a uh, 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 multiple endpoints in the in the company's network that has been going to that um, let's say ransomware destination. So you can identify all the devices um, that have been impacted again easily with uh, with a solution like DNS detection and response. So I know I I spoke a lot about the response side. Um, uh, you know, before I wrap up, I think uh, you know. It's all this is fine and good, but it's nothing if customers are not validating this method, right? The DNS detection and response. And uh, we've had a lot of customers who talk about the value of the data we have in the platform, the IPAM metadata and the DHCP metadata, which forms the basis for DNS detection and response. So this particular customer was a public energy and water utility in the US uh, for them. One of, the main, one of the main KPIs for them was reducing uh, mean time to remediation. So they wanted to improve the, or reduce the time it took to identify and respond and remediate an incident, right? And that was their main goal. And to, to, before they started using a DNS detection and response solution like Infoblox, they were spending several hours trying to associate user with the IP address whenever there was a security event. Obviously they have multiple security tools as part of defense in depth and all those alerts were just giving IP addresses and they used to spend a lot of hours trying to figure out what device, what user. Uh, the other thing those other security tools were doing is they were implementing a kind of black box approach. So they were blocking, fine, they blocked it, but they didn't say why they blocked it. There was no context behind why something was blocked, right? So they, those were two things that um, they were really struggling with. And when they implemented, or when they saw the a POC or a trial of the DNS detection response, uh, they loved the fact that they were able to get the username and the device attribution at the touch of a button because of the data that was there in, in IPAM and DHCP. And they were able to track users as users move from one IP address to another. So what this means is they got this actionable context, right? And also they knew why something was getting blocked because of the uh, context that's available in the threat investigation tool. So they knew what they were blocking, they knew which device they were blocking, and they, went, they knew why it was getting blocked. So this gave them freedom from this black box approach. And also it helped them quickly, um, you know, uh, remediate all, all these events that were happening. And of course they were using Splunk, so they were able to pull the data into their Splunk dashboards which also helped with their uh, with their analysis. 
So I'm going to stop there. I know I spoke for quite a, a while, um, but let's take any questions that have come through the chat. All right, Krupa, I have a couple questions that have come through. And feel free, everyone on the, the webinar to um, participate in the discussion as Krupa answers it. So uh, the first two questions are from Josh Kuo. He's asked, uh, encrypted DNS has gained a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. Uh, many are enabled by default in web browsers without the knowledge of the users. Uh, how does this encryption trend factor into DNS-based detection and response? Does it limit our solution? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what I, I would say is, um, I think what Josh is referring to is the dot and do, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, dot and do that has come out in the in the last couple of years. Dot is DNS over TLS, and do is DNS over HTTPS. So uh, those encryption, uh, you know, frameworks or whatever you want to call it, uh, they focus on privacy, right? So as Josh mentioned, sometimes your web browsers. I think one example is Firefox automatically routes you to uh, a third-party do resolver on the internet. Um, which which then processes all your DNS requests. So uh, we always recommend to um, while while encryption is good and privacy is good, but then it is security is getting compromised because you don't know if those door resolvers are um, implementing any sort of DNS based security um, um, as part of their offering, right? So we always recommend, and you will see Gartner say this too, which is organizations need to own their own resolver, meaning they need to have all the DNS queries that, are, that they're servicing for their own internal users and devices. They need to own the DNS resolver that is resolving those queries. So it has to be their own internal DNS because that means that they get the visibility, um, they can add security, like some of the things we talked about today, to make sure that um, you know there's no um, DNS-based exfiltration or other things that are happening and, and retain that visibility of what users are doing and what devices are doing. So going to a third-party door resolver is, is, is not recommended. Now, if, uh, if, the, if organizations are concerned about encryption, they can definitely use a vendor that provides uh, uh, you know, dot or dot um, for their uh, internal DNS. And, and I know that um, you know for internal DNS, uh, there are many vendors out there that provide that do and dot capability, including info blocks. Okay, thank you, Krupa. So uh, the next question is, is, is it relatively easy for an enterprise InfoSec team to implement DNS-based detection response as part of their process? Is there a big learning curve or upfront costs to this approach to security? Uh, another great question. So uh, DNS, like I said, is, a, is a, a part of the infrastructure, a part of the network that all organizations need anyway. Forget about the security part for a bit. You still need DNS for connectivity. So you can't have any online presence if you don't have DNS. So given that you already need to have DNS and you probably, all organizations have some form of DNS already, otherwise they won't be online. Um, it makes a lot of sense to implement DNS-based security on the DNS resolver. So in terms of how easy it is, um, there are a couple of ways to go about it. If you, uh, if you don't wanna replace all your DNS servers, let's say you're using you know, a, a, you know, a free DNS service or server and you don't wanna replace it, you can always use a vendor like Infoblox that provides DNS detection response um, at the forwarding layer, so that at least you get the baseline security, you may lose some visibility. You may lose the visibility to the endpoints that are making those requests, malicious requests, because we are now at the forwarding layer as opposed to close to the endpoints, but you will still get that baseline threat detection and blocking. So that is one way to uh, quickly implement some form of DNS security, either the forwarding layer, or we also have a cloud-based service. Um, so you can forward all your DNS requests to the cloud service, and that can handle all the detection and blocking. Um, the, the other, the, the most, I would say, 
thorough way to do it is obviously using a, a vendor that provides DNS detection and response for all your internal DNS, which means now you've implemented DNS detection and response across the board, across your entire network, and now you get that visibility and the protection and the ecosystem integrations that I talked about uh, for the response side, you get all of it uh, if you are using a vendor that provides the full DNS detection and response capability for your internal DNS. When I say internal, I mean like the recursive internal DNS. Yeah, yeah. thanks Krupa. So another question is, uh, how is Infoblox using DNS data to avoid lookalike attacks? So lookalike domains. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a very timely thing. Uh, so we are just, uh, uh, you know, we just launched the capability for uh, a lookalike domain. So a lookalike domains is, you know, as the name suggests, these are domains that kind of look like the legitimate thing, right? Uh, for example, I mean, any company could be a target of lookalike domain creation. For example, even Infoblox. Um, the the I in uh, Infoblox could be replaced with a small L, and that looks like a capital I. So it's, uh, you know, or, or Yahoo could be, you know, YAH00 instead of OO.com. So there are many, you know, many organizations that uh, probably have look like domains out there. They may not be even aware of it. Um, so the, the way that Infoblox can detect that is, uh, with our threat hunting capabilities that I talked about, um, the threat intel team at Infoblox is constantly monitoring for the uh, infrastructure out on the internet, uh, including lookalike domains that have been created, right? So they are constantly uh, looking for things like that. And when lookalike domains are detected, uh, they are then put into uh, a feed um, in our solution uh, so that any future DNS, once it's put in the feeds, then any requests, any DNS requests to those destinations will be blocked. Now, it could be, uh, there are a few ways to think about it. It could be uh, your own organization's lookalike domain um, that can be blocked. It could be your suppliers. It could be your partners, right, um, that have lookalike domains associated with it. So uh, a, a, a customer or a company can provide us all the domains that they want to uh, want uh, the threat intel team to watch out for, and it could be their own domain, it could be the supplier or partners' domains, and all of that information um, will be analyzed and and ident all the look like domains identified and then put into the feeds for blocking. Yeah. Perfect. Um, can you, DNS data be used to block um, multi-factor authentication? attacks or adversary man in the middle attacks? So the MFAs, we've seen a lot of MFA lookalikes uh, recently as well. So um, for the multi-factor authentication, what we've seen is uh, more recently, you know, a, an end user from a company might get, uh, uh, might get a notification on their phone saying, hey, you're, you're trying to log into a company uh, resource uh, you know, as part of the multi-effect uh, MFA process, you know, click here to authenticate, whatever, right? So, it, and that could come on their phones, right? Their smartphones. So if, uh, if the agent is installed, if the Infoblox agent is installed, uh, then that request, when they click, if they click, if they end up clicking on the link, link which they shouldn't, uh, it will go to the cloud service um, that's uh, that's a, that the Infoblox cloud service, and there we would know that okay, this 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 MFA is actually um, um, a lookalike, and it's it's going to a destination that's actually controlled by an attacker, and so we can block that um, in the cloud. So uh, for for smartphones and laptops. You know, I think we have a uh, you know agent approach is good, um, and so we have agents obviously uh, that can be deployed on on you know iOS and Android, and um, that then that way the Infoblox cloud will see that and and block it. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. So we have quite a few questions. I'm not going to ask you all of them, or we'll be here uh, for beyond the hour. But um, let me ask you one last one. Sure. So um, um, protective DNS, PDNS, 
Is that the same as DNS-based detection response? If I use a PDNS product or service, does that mean that I automatically have, automatically have DNS-based protection? That is another great question. So uh, many of you may have heard the term protective DNS or PDNS. It has been, um, uh, it has been made popular by actually a lot of government agencies uh, in the last couple of years. So uh, CISA or NSA uh, recommends uh, PDNS for their agencies. I know that in the UK, NCSC uh, actually offers free PDNS services for uh, some of their government agencies and emergency responders. So it is picking up quite a bit of momentum and other governments around the world are also looking at PDNS to protect their um, public networks, right? So it's definitely, um, it, it's great that um, the public sector is looking at DNS as a way to provide a first line of defense against a lot of malicious activities, including ransomware phishing and everything. Um, so I would, but I would say not all PDNS vendors uh, are the same. Uh, Infoblox obviously offers a PDNS service. It is, you know, it is the baseline of what we do from a DNS security perspective. So I would think, uh, I, I would categorize DNS detection and response as PDNS plus everything we do for the response side. So that includes the ecosystem integrations, that includes the IPAM and DHCP uh, data sharing, with those other tools and providing that information to SecOps for easy uh, instant response. So, um, you know, PDNS, I would consider it as a subset of DNS detection and response. Uh, so appreciate you being here, Krupa, and for talking to some of the super users uh, for our InfoBlox Experts community website. And I think that's Thank a wrap. Thank you. All right. Take care, y'all. Thanks for attending.